All right, welcome, welcome to uh, Abraham's Whiteboard. Uh, I'm Jeremy Fricke. I'm the Education and Program Director at Tri Faith Initiative. Um, tonight we are here to actually talk about uh, Samaritans, uh, both in the past and the present. Um, and I'm going to actually get my screen shared here, and uh, we're going to drop right into it. Uh, tonight we're actually going to have a couple of breakout sessions as well. So be prepared to chat and discuss a little bit with some of uh, the folks in the room today. Uh, just a reminder, a couple things about Abraham's whiteboard. Um, this, is, this is all about learning uh, all about different things with religion, uh, different topics, different religions, different histories. Um, and we usually try to make an attempt to uh, connect to the content to uh, Judaism, Christianity, and or Islam. And uh, really, if, if there are particular topics that you would be interested in us addressing in some way, please feel free to email me. Uh, email me or Allie. You, you'd probably uh, receive an email from either of us um, kind of regarding uh, these classes anyway. Um, an announcement also is uh, next month, we're actually having uh, Dr. Elena Morgan. Uh, talk about uh, Black Muslims and the war on drugs. Um, she's a, a scholar at a, the Southern California or South Carolina. I can't remember. SC. <laughs> um, either way, she's a wonderful person, um, very warm personality, and uh, is absolutely uh, you know a great scholar on on um, on this topic. So uh, please come back next month for for her. She'll be great. Um, tonight, we're going to be going over a lot of different things. We're going to kind of weave in and out uh, between uh, scripture uh, examples, as well as some history and some context to Samaritanism. Um, it's going to kind of be interwoven throughout the night, uh, partially because that is, that is actually what will make the most sense in this context. Um, We'll start with uh, some of the framing and grounding of Abraham's whiteboard in this class specifically. Uh, talk about some of the origins of Samaritanism. Uh, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion as well as a conversation about how sacred spaces pertain to both us and Samaritans in general. Um, and throughout the evening, we'll talk about inner log in the scriptures. Um, and then we'll kind of end uh, tonight's class on uh, conflict and marginalization and uh, the Samaritans today. So there's going to be a lot of little pieces. Um, we're trying to build an understanding, and I hope that a lot of the information that you gain tonight um, is helpful for learning more as well. Um, just a reminder, you know, there's no proselytizing at Tri-Faith Programs. Uh, and my intention, and I hope the intention of everyone in this room, is not to promote or dismiss any particular religion. Um, we all make mistakes sometimes, uh, but I hope all the best intentions, and I will have all the best intentions as well. Um, I also sometimes get questions about how we decide um, between different topics. We try to keep a balance between topics that have more impact uh, on uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims kind of only throughout the year, like per class. Um, <clears throat> and uh, tonight, the, the two main things that I hope that you walk away with is a little bit of a better knowledge about Samaritanism itself, as well as uh, maybe some new ways to think about any scripture um, in the context of how they talk about interreligious relations or interfaith relations. All right, so we're gonna start off almost right away with a breakout group. Um, and I'm going to ask you all to, to basically read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, Allie will actually post it in the chat. And I want you to think about if you were to view Samaritans as a separate religious group, what do you think this story means? Um, and let's see. <clears throat> oh, 
Oops. How did I pause that? I'll get it in the chat in one moment. It looks like Zoom has a character limit for the chat that this goes oh. beyond. So I might put it in two different chunks. OK, that's fine. Yeah, and if if you know the story, uh, I hope this helps you look at it with a, a new perspective. And if you don't know the story, I hope it uh, kind of gets speed on uh, one of the more common stories from the New Testament. So it is a little bit longer. Uh, we'll give you a, probably around eight minutes uh, with your group to read it together and to discuss uh, the question and the questions that you'd like to. And then uh, after the breakout room, we'll kind of report back and I'll, I'll kind of, uh, I'll keep going. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, I would love to hear any, any feedback uh, from this uh, discussion, you know, firstly, if this is a familiar story. Uh, secondly, um, have you ever thought about the Samaritan as a different religious group um, and uh, what you think that story means? Okay, I'll just say my group is much more intelligent than I, <laughs> I or more well-informed, I should say. I got, a, I, I got an, an, uh, a background in this. I knew nothing about this parable. I mean, I just knew of the parable. I didn't know that the, you know, the story between the Samarian, Samaritans and the Jews. So I had a good group for me. <laughs> I learned a lot, but I couldn't comment on personally on um, what I thought about it. Cause I, it was just, like I said, it was plunged into the new Testament. I had no idea that any of this was going on. So thank yep. you for doing that. Thanks for putting me in the group. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, of course. Anyone else want to chime in? Uh, we had a pretty, uh, pretty well-educated group um, when I was in. We we ended up uh, discussing more about the uh, importance of uh, the distinction between the priests, the Levites, and the Samaritans in this regard. Kind of like why were those three specific ones chosen? Because in other parables, you know, Jesus isn't exactly one to just pull things from random. Um, so we kind of got on, we kind of got on that discussion a little bit, uh, but then time ran out. I've got a feeling we could have gone for a while. You'll, you'll have more chances to discuss some smart ideas for sure. Anyone else want to add anything? You know, if, if you view Samaritans as a separate religious group, how does this impact the story? As it, you know just being a different religious group than whoever the audience is for this. Well, if, if the Samaritans are a separate religious group, group and possibly ethnically uh, different as well, that could set them out as an other. And in terms of some of the stereotyping that is done in current times with that process, mm -hmm. they might be the least likely or the most to, to be of help or the one being uh, more suspicious of their intentions and, and actions. And that would make the, the story all the more powerful when, when the goodness, the mercy was shown by the quote other. Right. And, um, you know, I want you to keep this story a little bit in the back of your mind. We're going to look at a lot of different uh, scriptural stuff, um, both mostly from the New Testament. Uh, I think uh, there's one or two from the Hebrew Bible as well. Um, but, you know, uh, let's, let's keep adding on to it. So one, we, we do need to talk a little bit about who are the Samaritans and where did they come from? Um, because they are uh, an important uh, religious group, especially they, they were much larger in the past um, uh, and they are much smaller today, which we'll talk about a little more later. But they they have a contested history, um, and what I mean by that is that there's no clarity, and that's partially because of how uh, long this group has been around. Um, this group has been around uh, for at least probably three thousand years or more, um, and uh, the Bible actually like the Hebrew Bible suggests that they are um, 
a group that comes from the Persian uh, settlement of northern uh, the northern kingdoms of Israel. Um, but uh, I do want to emphasize in general, I want to emphasize uh, the voices of the people that I'm talking about. So uh, the Samaritans uh, generally see themselves as Israelites, uh, not as the only Israelites, uh, but as some of the Israelites, um, as in uh, like Judaism kind of comes from, you know, the overarching uh, Israelite uh, kingdom, if you will. Um, the archaeology, and this is somewhere in between, I would argue, the archaeology of the area actually uh, uh, contests a little bit of what the biblical story is. So the biblical story suggests that Persians actually basically overrun the entirety of the northern kingdoms. Um, archaeological evidence suggests that the capital was overrun uh, Persian folks. So uh, there is a ability of kind of somewhere in between where we have um, both the, the Persian communities uh, that kind of overran uh, the northern kingdoms, as well as uh, some existing Samaritan peoples who lived in uh, more rural areas. So <clears throat> um, this is partially important because um, this connects to some of the biblical history, right? Um, when we're talking about the sort of connections between Abrahamic religions and uh, various peoples. Um, the Samaritans have a long history and uh, a long interreligious connection with uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. <clears throat> so um, just to add a little bit more, uh, traditionally, uh, Judaism, especially in the Bible, uh, comes from the tribes primarily of Judah and Benjamin. <clears throat> um, the Samaritans claim to be in part from the peoples who are mostly in, in the area uh, where Samaria is. So <clears throat> uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and, and some Levites, there's a claim that there is a shared um, a deeply shared Israelite history with uh, Jewish folks in particular. All right. Now, I do wanna ask, because this will be especially important for the Samaritans, how do we determine that a place is holy? And are there places like geographical places, physical places that are more holy than others? to you. And uh, this is not a breakout one. Feel free to, to, you know, raise your hand, chime in, type in the chat. Holy to me means more like the temperament or positioning of individuals than it does to a place or a building. Spiritual, spiritual rather than physical. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, it, for me, it seems to almost be kind of a cultural interpretation. A lot of cultures that, um, that are considered more Eastern kind of like have places that are exceptionally spiritual and therefore are holy in their own regard. Um, um, for example, like old Shinto religions and whatnot, like certain forests were specifically more holy than other places for one reason or another. Um, and then when you get into uh, like Celtic religious history, a lot of the places they deemed uh, holy ended up being kind of architecturally significant, even to the point that uh, they were significant before Celtic uh, history may have occurred. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting little coincidence of nothing else. Um, but on a personal level, I, I kind of tend to, if a place, I kind of interpret a place as holy based on the reverence that the people in the area give it, uh, because they would know, so to speak. Like there's just kind of like an aura or a feel that they would have living there 
and being part of the land that um, someone like myself who would not necessarily be there would have. Thank you. Uh, Carrie? Yeah, hey, so I think that's really interesting that you brought up that question because it's probably coming up later, but one of the more prevalent Samaritans also in the Gospels is the woman at the well. And I, I didn't look it up, so I can't say exactly, but I want to say that she said, well, you say we have to worship in Jerusalem, but we worship at the well of, I'm going to say the well of Abraham, which obviously should be a pretty darn holy place too. So um, as, as was said earlier, there's um, differences in cultures and what makes something holy sometimes. Yeah, that's a great point. And we will be, uh, we will be talking about both the well and the Samaritan woman uh, in just uh, probably just a few minutes. <clears throat> um, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for your uh, feedback. I would love to ask if anyone would be willing to uh, uh, read this in a moment. I'm going to tell a little bit about it, and I would love for somebody to read. Um, so <clears throat> we are actually one of the most important uh, places for the Samaritans is uh, Mount Gerizim. Um, this is this is one of the big things that really uh, sets uh, sets them apart when it comes to uh, other Abrahamic religions, other religions of the Middle East. Um, and this is actually a um, a text from the Hebrew Bible that that kind of uh, gives a lot of relevance to uh, to what Samaritans believe. Um, yeah, Carrie. From Deuteronomy chapter 11, 26 to 29. See, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Blessing for obeying the commandments of the Lord your God, which I gave you today. Curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way I command you today to go after other gods whom you do not know. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you are to enter and possess, then on Mount Gerizim, you shall pronounce the blessing. On Mount Abel, the curse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so Mount Gerizim is a UNESCO uh, protected site. Uh, you can see the little arrow on the left here. Um, the interpretation of this commandment and others um, really orients around that the proper place for the worship of, um, of the, the God of the Israelites is uh, Mount Gerizim. <clears throat> Mount Gerizim uh, is in uh, the modern day West Bank, but it's close to the Israel border. Um, and uh, it's uh, Shechem, which is this little town here is uh, what's between Mount Gerizim and, and Mount Ebal. So, um, we'll actually talk a little bit about that in a second. Yep. So the, um, the Samaritans share quite a bit. Um, they actually have the, a very, very similar Torah or uh, Pentateuch, which is the Greek for the first five books of uh, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it's exactly the same in a lot of ways. Um, firstly, it's written in Hebrew, but it is written in Paleo-Hebrew. Which is a, a, a different a different version. Um, you can actually see some of the uh, some of the letters down here at the at the bottom. One of the most important things is again, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, the in the Hebrew Bible, there's many references to the holiness or the um, the importance of the places where God is called. In the Samaritan text, it says the place where God is called. So there is a, an, a kind of assumption that the, that the person uh, knows that as a Samaritan, you do this at Mount Gerizim. Um, <clears throat> they share basically the same uh, core history as, um, as Jews, Christians, uh, and Muslims about this kind of... Um, the history of the Hebrew Bible, basically, uh, where you have, you know, Adam and Eve, and you have the flood of Noah, and then you have, um, you know, Abraham and this, and um, 
after, uh, sorry, but after Moses, it starts getting a little more complicated. Um, they do not see any books after the, uh, the first five as holy. Um, they, they see them as sort of an interpretation of history. Um, the history that they disagree with, uh, again, orients mostly around the place where God may be called. Um, there's a, there, and this is going a little deeper into biblical studies, but there's kind of an understanding of uh, the, high, uh, the times after the high priest Eli um, are not groups. Um, they, the Samaritans, would argue that um, it's not great because he built an altar to God in Shiloh um, rather than Mount Gerizim. Um, and then basically you have the same problem in their view of building um, holy places in Jerusalem. So this has actually caused a lot of conflict, as you may expect, both in the past and, and even to today um, between various groups in the area. Um, I also want to point out that some people will ask this about, uh, about Samaritan texts and the Samaritan uh, Pentateuch. And I want to be clear that, um, firstly, scholars don't know which one came first from a very secular academic point of view. Um, and in some ways, it doesn't really matter because the, the point here is that these, although there are there's much held in common. That's the first step. And then the second piece is that um, the differences mostly can be summed up to um, different perspectives on very similar events. You know, th this is kind of uh, something that comes up with a lot of scripture studies is what came first. Well, most of it doesn't really have to do with that. It has to do with how do we interpret our, the history? How do we interpret um, events in general? And that tends to have much more uh, importance than which one was written first. <clears throat> All right. So I'd like to break up again. And we're actually going to look at another, uh, another New Testament story. Um, call, uh, we can call it the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. There's a lot of options. Um, and I, I want a very similar kind of conversation, right? Uh, if we think about the Samaritan woman primarily as sort of the religious other, um, what do you notice? You know, what do you notice about this if we're thinking about this as interfaith dialogue? So I'm going to give you a similar amount of time as last time uh, to read this together. We've we uh, haven't given all the story because it's a very long story, um, but we've given some of the core pieces. So, um, And note that it's once again in two different parts in the chat. So you'll see two different parts that have the scripture text and then another chat message that has the question. Everyone back here. Yep. Welcome back. Uh, I hope hope the conversation was enjoyable. I'd love to hear uh, any thoughts, any feedback. Uh, what do you notice about this story? Is this a familiar story, etc. Um, and we can start with Ian. Um, how is it? Uh, my group did really well and actually had a lot of wisdom to uh, impart in regards to the discussion. Um, one of the things that, uh, that was picked up on was how even the, the question that was asked, looking at this example of interfaith dialogue, uh, itself changes depending on your own personal background, whether from a Jewish background or a Protestant background, what have you, based on your own interpretation of who Jesus is and all of that. Um, and we kind of came to this, uh, kind of this overall conclusion that it was it was kind of a really complex way to bridge the gap between the two almost he like kind of takes this interesting like third option like you're here you're here uh, you're here the jewish people are here you both have very interesting 
and very accurate takes on like you worship what you do not understand but you worship and then basically it seemed to imply that the samaritans were spiritually correct to a degree um but <clears throat> it, it, it's a it's a very complex thing and we were all kind of having a very fun time trying to piece together various aspects of it yeah thank you uh who else would like to add I will, I will speak for our group group one or room one i think we thought it seemed like anti-tri-faith in, in in jesus seemed like an anti-tri-faith person you know because to say you worship what you do not understand where we worship what we do understand that's not a good good way to open up a tri-faith discussion and okay we we couldn't really get it we we, we wondered it seemed like that that doesn't seem much like the Jesus that we thought we knew. Oh, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a valid look at it. Um, it was funny because I've read that numerous times and it never occurred to me that um, he seemed like he was trying to proselytize, I'm not saying it correctly, but um, telling her that she needed to join his crew basically. I'd never, never seen that in it before until it was put this way. <laughs> so what do you see about it? Mm, not so sure I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, Ian. I think um, uh, we, we kind of touched on this a bit in uh, group two a little bit was uh, going back to the kind of the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jewish people, uh, the Samaritan woman very obviously recognized Jesus as a Jewish individual. And Jesus, of course, more than likely recognized her as a Samaritan individual. And if there was any doubt, um, especially after she was flabbergasted that she that he would drink from the same water as she would. Um, so even so, even though his dialogue may have dictated that, you know, he was kind of being like, well, you're wrong. Uh, he was willing to do something that was kind of culturally unacceptable, right? He was willing as a Jewish person to share in a drink with a Samaritan individual, which in little parentheses states, you know, that the Samaritans and the Jewish people, you know, don't, don't have that kind of relationship. Uh, so the way I kind of looked at it was when he was talking, he almost kind of took the third option, right? It's like, you worship what you don't understand, the Jewish people worship what they do understand. However, you're both wrong. Look at, listen to what I have to say. I've got this third option where it's not just going to be about place. It's going to be about kind of the spiritual aspect everywhere and anywhere. Um, so I'm not like, he's like, a, like, a, like Bill said, it is very kind of an anti faith aspect to it. Sure. Um, to the point where he's like, no, you're both wrong. So, and I have the solution. Uh, but he still was willing to kind of show, I guess he was kind of, from what my interpretation was, he was talking about different aspects that were correct from both angles, but that neither, that like kind of, the Samaritans were doing something the Jewish people weren't doing and the Jewish people were doing something the Samaritans weren't doing. And because of that, they were both wrong. But if they got both sides working in tandem, they'd have the right idea. Or I might just be crazy, one of the three. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what scripture is all about is like, you know, uh, you know, read it, think about it, uh, <laughs> kind of decide how, what, uh, how the story makes the most sense to you. Um, any other, any other uh, points of view? Um, did anyone read this uh, more positively um, or, or see it as a more positive uh, interfaith relationship? Uh, yeah, Carrie. Oh, uh, you're muted. Yeah. Nope. I think she. Okay. I've always considered it positive. If nothing else, then Jesus is speaking to a woman, which right there is a very radical thing to do, also. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, the. the we also have to remember, and uh, you are certainly welcome to watch some of the other videos that we've we've made. Uh, one is on uh, what is religion, and religion is not as separate as it is today in this time. 
um, you know, a concept like tri-faith doesn't really make sense because religion is wrapped up with tribe and culture and ethnicity and, and geographic location and political group in a way that it just isn't quite at the same level today. So while, you know, I, I think there's a lot of value to kind of using this as a thought proce process, um, you know, if we're looking at it um, in a more historical sense, it's, it just can't be quite apples to apples. Um, even though there is value to uh, use different lenses for these things. Um, I want to point out that uh, this is Jacob's well, um, at least the vast majority of uh, both uh, biblical scholars. And uh, I, I mean, my understanding is there isn't a whole lot of disagreement, um, regardless of being Jewish, Christian, or uh, Samaritan uh, about the location of Jacob's well being basically very close to this mountain um, or kind of on a, a side of this mountain. Jacob, Jacob's well is, um, it's part of uh, the story of Jacob. Um, it's unclear exactly where the location is, but sort of like Abraham, uh, or sorry, uh, Isaac. Now I'm, now I'm getting a little confused. <laughs> um, the, the land was gifted to him by his father and uh, he built a, a deep well there. Um, there's still a well there. Um, it is a very deep well. Um, basically, I, I think they're talking like a hundred feet. Um, I can't remember how wide it is, but it's a fairly large well. And today it actually is surrounded by an Orthodox church. Um, there have been, you know, disagreements as to exactly who should have it, but it, it has been an Orthodox church for a few hundred years now. Um, so that is yet another lens on, <laughs> on how you could think about this story. You know, what does it mean that, uh, Jacob's well water is, uh, is shared, um, in this circumstance, right? And here are a couple pictures. This is of the story of uh, Jacob seeing uh, Rachel for the first time and uh, some photos of the area itself. Uh, yeah, Jean. I have a different interpretation. If you look forward to verses 21 through 24, mm -hmm. I feel like that's basically saying we're all coming at this from different perspectives. You know, one of us is coming from the mountain. One of us sees Jerusalem as the, the high point or the, play, the special place. But in the end, the true worshipers will worship the Father, God. We're all coming at the same God. And God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So I kind of see this as turning into a tri-faith kind of a focus. Coming at, coming at it from different perspectives, but ending up in the same place. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to, to read it. I think uh, all those are very valid. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question, Ian, about uh, whether Jesus is a Samaritan. I, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, that in a minute, too. Uh, <laughs> So I also, um, one thing I wanted to make sure, uh, I realized that I didn't explicitly say this, that Samaritans are not Jewish, they're not Christian, they're a, a, a different Abrahamic religion that is probably closer to uh, Judaism than any other uh, Abrahamic tradition, but is not, they would not see themselves as Jewish. Um, Jewish people would not see them as Jewish. It's just, they're, they're still a separate religion. All right. Okay. Um, would anyone like to uh, read this? So this actually is in, in uh, response a little bit to, uh, to actually what you just suggested, Ian. Um, so if you'd like to read it, maybe you should be the one to read it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, all right. <clears throat> John eight forty eight to 51. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? 
I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. <clears throat> Sorry, my uh, screen is blocking it. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. <clears throat> so, um, uh, we're not going to do a breakout group for this one in particular, but I would love to hear, you know, why, why does Jesus avoid the question about him being a Samaritan? I think there's a lot of ways you can answer that, but, um, and, and in a sense, again, what does that mean for uh, any responsibilities associated with interfaith relationships? Um, Jesus is kind of known for um, turning around a question and answering what he cares to answer, not the stupid question that was given to him. So my first instinct is to treat that passage that way. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Well, what, I mean, why does he think the Samaritan question is stupid then? Well, maybe stupid isn't the right word. Um, I was thinking of the incident when he told uh, the people, you know, he who throws the first, uh, he who's without sin can throw the first stone, um, that, that whole passage in the Bible. But um, I think that he has a point he wants to make. He's a little bit like a politician that way. He's going to make the point he wants to make rather than addressing that. But I don't know. Um, I assume he would not want to be associated as a Samaritan to people who think Samaritans are not as legitimate. Thank you. Any other, any other uh, things people see in this? I see, uh, Ian, you got your hand up. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be chiming in a lot, but um, I mean, kind of along with the politician rhetoric, who's to say he didn't answer the question? Uh, he addresses the demon thing first and foremost. Yes, um, I am not possessed by a demon. Uh, but then he goes on to discuss, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I, I, you could interpret this as him implicitly answering segment of uh, the first part of the question, which is also, if we take it that way, a dig at Samaritan culture as well, especially from a Jewish perspective at this time period, right? Uh, so I'm not saying he did answer the question. I'm saying it could be interpreted that maybe he did roundaboutly answer it in one way. Uh, but again, I, that's just me kind of hypothesizing. Yeah, that's fair too. Yeah. Any, any other particular perspectives on this? Well, well I'll tell you what I, what, what I think is uh, <laughs> my favorite way of interpreting it. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, I have a question, please. Of course. What is, what, is there significance about being asked uh, if he is demon possessed? It, it, is, that, <laughs> is that related to associating him with the possibility of being a Samaritan or is that a more general question? So um, that depends on who you ask. Um, <laughs> as all things with religion are, <laughs> okay? Um, but I will say that uh, Samaritans have, not really today, but it, it appears based off of literature that um, there was some association with Samaritans and folk magic. Um, and that kind of ends up correlating to, you know, Jesus and miracles, right? So, um, you know, if he's a Samaritan doing folk magic and demon possession is kind of related to the, some of the folk magic uh, attitudes at, at the time by some people, um, it, it could be in some ways the same question to the people asking it, right? That, uh, you know, are you a Samaritan and demon possessed? That those things are more about like, are you, do you have magical powers by some corrupt means? Um, the, so, so I, I hope that helps. I mean, um, we don't know exactly 
what uh, what was intended by that. But if the most famous Samaritan, um, I believe, that has a name in the in the Bible is uh, Simon Magus, um, who's associated also with folk magic. He he converts to Christianity, um, but becomes very controversial early in in the in the Bible story. Um, and there are many times. I, I also want to point out a couple other things, just because this is kind of taken a little bit out of context. Um, uh, there are many times where Jesus uh, is clearly Jewish. You know, he he clearly calls himself Jewish many many times. Other people call him Jewish many more times than Samaritan. But I I find it interesting that this is how he responds to the question. Um, to me, you know, I, I think a, a more positive theological way to think about this is that it, it actually kind of reminds me of um, the Sikh community after 9-11, where I know this seems kind of like a stretch here for a second, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll get back to it. Um, after 9-11, there was a lot of violence and uh, discrimination against Muslims. Um, there the community that received a very high level of impact per capita was the Sikh community. They wore turbans and were associated with the people on TV who had turbans. Um, many, many Sikhs talked about how they were often asked if they were Muslim. And on one end, they weren't, right? On the other end, what happens when you say, no, I'm not, right? It, it kind of implies that it's okay to attack Muslims if, if they say, no, I'm not, you don't need to worry about me kind of attitude. So um, there's something to be said about, um, even in this context, Jesus saying, Jesus avoiding that question intentionally, um, not, not saying he is or isn't, um, because you could argue that he's saying you shouldn't you shouldn't be using Samaritan itself as a, uh, as a slur against people anyway. That's, that's my favorite interpretation. <laughs> there's a lot of ways to look at it and uh, there's a lot of valid ways to look at it. Um, but yeah, all right. Um, another, another one, and again, you know, we're trying to kind of learn about Samaritanism through uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim uh, eyes. Would anyone like to read this? Or am I here? Or do I have to call on somebody? How's this going? I gotta be the me I will do that. Well. <laughs> Oops. Okay, you got to do a virtual arm wrestling to see who wins. <laughs> then whoever, whoever gets to go. Um, go ahead. You, okay. Go ahead, Nancy. When the days for his being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. All right. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I can tell you're very excited, Ian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, what do you think about that, uh, Nancy? Well, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and now they're not going to accept him into the Samaritan village because of that. It's like, I'm on my way to Lincoln, but Gretna's got no, going, not going to let me in because I'm really on my way to Lincoln. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's fair. <laughs> that's totally fair. Um, that 
Does, I'm going to I'm going to say no to Ian for a second here. I, I would love to see um, who else would uh, like to make a guess. Why does the Samaritan village not accept Jesus? Um, uh, Jesus with their hospitality. Well, was Jerusalem way too Jewish for the Samaritans? Mm -hmm. Um, that's, th does anyone else want to add to that? <laughs> I, uh, you, you are thinking about this as a interreligious, uh, situation, and that's a good, a good way to think about it. Um, could it be that he, they knew they were, would not be, um, welcome in Jerusalem. So he felt, they felt the same about him. Okay. Any others? Th these are both great, great guesses. What's the basis for the Samaritans' hate of Jerusalem? So um, it, okay. So most of it has to do with that they, they believe that the holy place is Mount Gerizim. And that, you know, because Moses basically said that this is where you're supposed to do blessings, right? That's kind of where we got that, uh, that earlier text. This is where you're supposed to do blessings. They're, they can be very, very literalist. They are very, very literalist about this. Um, you, you do the rituals there. And, uh, you know, over over the history of the last 2,500 years or more, actually, maybe more like 3,000 years, they see um, establishing the temple in particular in Jerusalem and establishing the Jerusalem as the holiest place as, as against that core commandment in their view. Because they take that, uh, that blessing on... Mount Gerizim very, very, very seriously. Um, Lisa. Uh, well, that, that's what I was going to say, uh, was that the temple was established in Jerusalem and uh, had been destroyed and rebuilt. And so I would suspect that was the biggest uh, problem was that uh, that was, in fact, that's where the Holy of Holies was, was in the temple. Only certain people could go in there. So I could imagine that's where they, uh, uh, well, you just explained it, but I, that, that's the only thing I could think of was when you talked about a holy place, that's what Jerusalem was. It was the home of the temple. Right. Um, and uh, Jean? Isn't this uh, showing us that during those times, the population was as drastically segmented as it is today? We have, we have maybe Muslim, Christian, and... Jewish, you know, with our separate sources of the Bible or the meaningful word. And there, their, their population is segmented just as drastically with each population thinking they're right and needing to talk to each other to understand where they have things in common. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that is very fair. And I, and we'll get to it in a, in a minute here. But it is important also to remember that um, the Samaritans are not, even though they are much smaller today, they are not of the past and uh, they still have impact and are impacted by, um, in particular, the conflicts in uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, I, again, I'm going to kind of give the benefit of the doubt for a second. Um, the part of this also is that they're going to be against um, against supporting pilgrimage to the temple, right? This is during the days leading up to Passover in the context of the Jesus story. This is the time where people take pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem for the temple. They, they believe that the pilgrimage for Passover goes to Mount Gerizim. So a lot, so basically providing hospitality to someone who is doing pilgrimage there would be um, against one of those core divisions 
um, between uh, Jewish people and Samaritans um, in this time. Um, not saying it's right or wrong, but but it's a it's a uh, religious belief to not do that, and it's still to some extent a religious belief, you know, to um, to not overly support those things. Uh, it's uh, it's not quite as uh, hostile as it once was, but it's it's still there. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the conflict and marginalization, just because you know there were probably um, ba basically like second to fourth centuries uh, CE. There were probably around uh, thirty to a hundred thousand. Um, Samaritans, uh, almost all in the area of Mount Gerizim. Um, even today, most uh, Samaritans are close to Mount Gerizim, as you might imagine. Um, the the kind of first uh, attack, if you will, uh, was second century BCE. Um, you know, we, we have a long history of conflict between different religious groups. Um, and uh, many, many people were killed for that. Uh, the temple was destroyed. Um, there was a temple on Mount Gerizim. Um, they were they were mostly attacked by um, some of the um, the like uh, Jewish kingdoms at the time. Um, there's a lot of conflict. You also have to remember, and this is actually something that comes up with other religious groups today, um, is that there tends to be an association of, um, of disloyalty if the holy place is different. So um, in this example, you know, someone who isn't, who is that unsupportive of Jerusalem is not just unsupportive of Jerusalem, but they're unsupportive of the nation as a whole. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, we can also talk about another small religious group for a moment, you know, uh, the Baha'i community who has um, who has some holy places in Israel and uh, is often associated with disloyalty in certain countries that have uh, strong critiques of Israel. So, you know, this kind of thing happens often uh, where uh, when there's conflict about the locus of holiness, then um, uh, then then it, it's more than religion at a certain point. It becomes uh, deeply political and more about politics at a certain point than religion itself. Um, the most of that disagreement really fundamentally is around disagreement on, where the temple should be. Um, just, is it Mount Gerizim or is it on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? And I think we gotta recognize that this is a common story, <laughs> you know, throughout all the world by different people. Um, but I do wanna point out that there's always, it's not like everything has always been terrible or even uh, terrible at the same level with, uh, with Samaritans or with religious conflict in general. I mean, even uh, you know, se second century, uh, there's some Mishnah, uh, which is basically Jewish guidance um, that says very specifically that uh, Jewish people should eat and pray with Samaritans. Uh, there shouldn't be a prayer to Mount Gerizim, but basically everything else is okay. Um, uh, there's kind of a, uh, a note in this, uh, this part of the Mishnah where it says, um, you, you have to wait till the end to say amen so that you make sure that you're not saying amen to, to that particular blessing. Um, but, you know, just like I said before, different political things happen over time. And I, we could go into detail about all that. I'm not going to tonight. Um, just because that's, I mean, it's, uh, it can be kind of drab anyway. Um, but over time, there's more and more political conflict. Uh, and um, 
Samaritans are, are considered absolute Gentiles, which is kind of a, a different category than Gentile. You know, it's a more, it's a more negative one at the time in the seventh century. Um, Jeremy, is that, yeah. is that seventh century common era? Yes. Yes. Um, here, I got a little more here. So, so like I said, there were, there were many more Samaritans in the past um in the early years of uh of islam uh samaritans were considered people of the book and, and still are um although that has been complicated again in part because they're kind of a uh tertiary abrahamic religion in some ways right they're kind of they're kind of seen as as less than uh in comparison to jews christians and muslims and have generally had, you know, uh, not a great time throughout their entire history, to be completely honest. Um, and the uh, kind of the nail in the coffin for a large portion of Samaritans is kind of the last years of the Christian Roman Empire, uh, where they were targeted um, alongside many other religious minorities. And uh, again, because they have a, a very particular location that is considered especially holy, um, they're, um, they, they were more easily targeted. <clears throat> so that's fun stuff. Um, no. Um, does anyone have any, oh, actually, hold on here. Um, yeah, does anyone have any particular questions about any of this so far? We're going to go to kind of um, today a little bit and sort of the current, um, some of the current situations with Samaritans in particular. But does anyone have any questions before we move on from there? Okay, um, Marta? And you are on mute. Okay, I'm I'm muted. I I uh, came in late. I thought it was starting at seven thirty, so I missed the very beginning, which probably laid the foundation. But my question is, um, I find it very interesting that even in those times, they had some kind of a hierarchy of who was better than who, <clears throat> and putting it just in plain language. And uh, I just think that that's particularly interesting. Uh, given what we're experiencing today. So I'm, I was hoping that we could have some kind of support or lesson to help us navigate where we are today in our society and in the world culture. Uh, and on this, in this part, it says still, they were considered less than by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Still, they were protected as people of the book by Muslim empires. So uh, can you shed some light on that, sure. on that particular history? Why was it that they were separated and seen as less than, but yet they wanted to protect them? So, uh, so the protection part first, um, they share enough in common with the Torah that uh, they're seen as, as of the same lineage, if you will, you know, that they, okay. they have some, the, some ultimate root that is shared uh, with all people of the book. The, uh, the, the less than peace, honestly, is something that we should be really thinking about today. You know, when you're asking about sort of lessons for today, mm -hmm. um, the, the people who receive the most discrimination today in total are uh, Jews and Muslims in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, we also do have to recognize that um, that the, that people, that people who are part of religions that are even smaller than Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, um, tend to have their own types of discrimination and seem less than, you know, there's, um, we live in a country where we generally get Christmas and Easter off. This is a, this is a softer thing than like absolute violence, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, some people, not very many, uh, get, uh, 
get some understanding of, of uh, Jewish or Muslim holidays. Um, but the vast majority of like, you know, Baha'i holidays or Sikh holidays or, uh, you know, other tiny religions, um, people have no idea that they, that the group even exists, let alone um, know how to give space for some level of equity um, in representation. You know, there's different problems for everybody. Um, but I think, I think the story of the Samaritans kind of shows us that um, we need to continuously work to be more inclusive, right? We, we need to really work at um, understanding and, um, you know, supporting people of all religious backgrounds uh, with the, the power that we do have, you know, what, regardless of uh, the community that we're a part of. Because, I mean, they, they have a long history of being like, like many other groups, sadly, they have a long history of being killed um, by basically everybody. Um, specifically at this time though, um, it, it fundamentally has to do with uh, priority. Um, so <clears throat> the, the main groups that were people of the book that were clearly people of the book and large enough, you know, are Christians and, and Jewish people. Um, when conflicts come up between Christians or, or Jewish people and another group, um, in general, the, uh, the Christians at this time, Christians would have been prioritized first, then Jewish people, then everybody else. Um, that's just kind of how it ends up occurring both in the past and today. You know, you, you, pro, you, there are priorities, you know, people, um, although like, uh, you know, the situation for um, Jews and Christians under uh, Muslim empires was much better than like under Christian empires. Um, it still was sort of a second class citizenship, um, but it, it was a little less than second class citizenship for Samaritans and others. And that's, that's a broad stroke over a huge amount of history, a huge amount of diversity. We're talking about millennia here, um, but I'm, I'm trying to answer the question as quickly as possible. Does that, does that help? And please, you know, if anyone has any questions, comments, critiques, concerns about anything that I said, you know, please feel free to add in. This is a tough, tough conversation and tough topic. It's kind of curious to me, Jeremy, that um, uh, even, I mean, they had that category of people of the book, but yes, they had to have a hierarchy. What was it about the Samaritans that put them in that position? How different were they? Did they look different or did they just behave in different ways? Most of it has to do with population size. Oh. Now it's, that's what I would argue anyway. Um, they are they were a smaller group. Smaller groups are easier to ignore. Um, wow. they, they are different and they consider themselves an ethno-religious group. Um, as in, you know, uh, have, uh, have an ethnicity as well as religion. Um, that's what I was wondering. If it was their appearance, their ethnicity, their customs, what, what, place them in that vulnerable spot it it mostly has to do with politics and um population size mm -hmm. and then also the like i mentioned earlier you know the the geographic specificity of mount gerizim makes them easier to target as a whole oh. so so yeah um not pretty um I do want to talk a little bit about Samaritans today, if no one else has any questions or critiques or concerns about any of the, the harder stuff. Um, they, they continue to hold something that looks similar to a temple sacrifice uh, from 2000 years ago. Um, they, they do the Passover sacrifice of, of a lamb and it's basically in reality, even though 
you know, people have different visions of what this is. It honestly is mostly like a, a barbecue um, with uh, prayers, honestly. Um, there's there's a, you barbecue a lamb overnight and you share it with the community. And uh, there's there's a lot of ritual purity involved and a lot of prayers involved. But, but in reality, it's, um, I think people like to overly exoticize uh, this, you know, uh, an animal sacrifice, but really it's, it's more familiar than most people would uh, just think about, to be completely honest. Um, and today, you know, they're, they're numbered at less than a few thousand, um, even though they've been influential on the, the history and relationships between Jews, Christians, Muslims for thousands of years, they're very small today. Um, today, they have a very complicated relationship with both Israel and Palestine. Um, there's a story about uh, how um, I read, a, I think I read it in the New York Times about a Samaritan man's father who, uh, who worked at a nonprofit basically in Palestine uh, during the day, and he was ambushed by some Palestinian uh, militants at the time. He, he was shot, and he uh, drove to uh, Israel to get medical care, and he was shot by the, the border agents there. Um, so there's a very complicated uh, relationship uh, with Samaritans and and that uh, the Mount Gerizim is in Palestine, but uh, many uh, many Samaritans technically live just over the border. Um, there's a border like very very close to that area. Um, all right, let's see the and that's a great question, uh, Margaret. Uh, whether there's a diaspora, basically. By and large, there is not much of a diaspora um, that because of how important it is uh, for them to be able to access Mount Gerizim. Um, there's a longer, there's a little bit of a history about um, the right to return in Israel, about whether it applies to uh, Samaritans. Um, in the 90s, they did uh, approve that uh, Samaritans would have the right to uh, the would have access to the law of return to Israel, um, but it took a while um, because they don't they don't have Jewish identity. Um, mm -hmm. They have like a you know it's a Jewish adjacent you know it's not it's not Jewish. They would not see themselves as Jewish. Jewish people don't see them as Jewish. You know it's it's important to remember that um, this is its own Abrahamic religion in the area. Um, the one interesting thing that is happening, and this is actually happening with a lot of the smaller, especially Middle Eastern religions, is um, there's an interest in people converting in different areas. So uh, I don't know exactly why, but there's a growing number of, of, of people in Brazil who are really associating with Samaritanism. You know, I, I don't know why, I just know that uh, people are noticing that, in particular, Brazil, for some reason, is is really um, having an interest in these smaller, basically small Abrahamic religions of uh, of this area <clears throat> that are, you know, uh, underrepresented. In, Interesting. In <clears throat> so. Um, I, I do want to ask again, you know, if anyone has any particular questions or comments, you know, did you, did you gain anything with the understanding of uh, Samaritanism in scripture or Samaritanism in, you know, real life? Um, I, I just, it didn't seem to me that any existed these days because you, I don't see anything in the newspapers or anywhere, um, uh, you know, of the general kinds of, of information that gets out. And on the internet, I don't know, I haven't checked or followed up, but 
um, I've always, uh, the stories I remember is the, here, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Those are the kinds of things. And I thought, well, these m must be gentle, caring people. But now as you're going into this and, and more into scripture, I find out that uh, they sort of a really um, mar a marginal group. Um, I mean... Okay, so one thing to remember is, uh, you know, every book is written by somebody in a certain time, about in a certain place, you know, and uh, there's things that they're impacted by, um, whether they realize it or not, you know, and I'm, I'm taking it from a less uh, religious point of view, of course, but, um, you know, a, a, a book is intended for a particular audience. And um, as I as I mentioned earlier, you know this this group in particular has a political um, uh, political impact, you know, because of this uh, adamancy about where is the holiest place, right? It, it is a core part of the identity of Samaritans and of many people around the world. I mean, most of the religions, I mean, all the religions represented on the commons and most religions have a holy place. I mean, kind of what we're talking about has some implication for questions about Israel and Palestine in the first place. Um, I'd rather not get into that particular topic, but, um, but I think we can, we can see the impact of the conflict uh, through sort of Samaritan's eyes too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I want to also just point out, so the, the temple is destroyed, and I, I don't have a great picture of it, to be completely honest, but um, the ruins are mostly uh, mostly the floor still, and, and they still do uh, most of those, like most of the Passover rituals and other, um, other religious rituals through that. Um, they do the same holidays uh, that are prescribed in the Torah, but not the holidays that are um, associated with later his later Jewish history, because uh, they they're not Jewish; they don't have the same history. Um, but when it comes to the Torah, they have those shared, um, you know, Shavuot, uh, um, Passover, and Sukkot are all important to the Samaritans, uh, but but they don't do Hanukkah, for example. Um, and let's see, a lot, there was one other picture I wanted to point out, I thought, but um, yeah. I, there, all there's, that makes me think of real estate has in them, you know, because they're located, they see that as a holy place. Is there anything on those lands that um, is financially uh, desired by others than the Samaritans? The there are holy like oil or, uh, or uh, precious metals or it is it is quite protected actually in the first place. It's uh, it's mostly protected as an archaeological site. Uh, uh, so. Yeah. So there isn't anything like that today, anyway. I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to that particular question, but um, this, you know, I mean, it. This is a mountain that's mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, has associations with the well, uh, uh, th with the woman at the well in Jesus' story, and uh, has implications for you know Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you know, which add up to be a large portion of the world, right? Um, Although the Samaritans are small, they have interwoven um, destinies to some extent with uh, with other religions as well. Um, I want I want to say uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for for being here, and I I hope you you know uh, you gained something both about uh, sort of seeing the interfaith relationships in scriptures. You know maybe. Uh, look back at some of the stories that you've read and, and think about, you know, what is this saying about interfaith relations? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, and sometimes you can, you can kind of see the nuance. It, it's more about that 
interfaith relations have always been real. You know, they've always existed. Um, and scriptures aren't always about what is the right thing, but also sometimes just a demonstration of reality, even if um, it isn't an ideal. Um, but if you have any other questions or, or comments or anything like that, please feel free uh, to email me. Um, and I would love to have a conversation with you. Also, if you have any particular um, uh, particular suggestions for future topics, uh, whether it's a religious group or, or a particular topic or anything like that, um, I would be happy to um, either teach about it myself, have, have Allie teach about it, or um, we'll have a guest about it at some point. So again, thank you very much. And uh, you will all get a recap soon in, the, in your email with a survey link and uh, the YouTube video. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeremy. Thank, Thank you. you.